lands there in the uh, Jordan River, and um, it sinks, and the guy just gets really uh, upset about it. He's borrowed it, and so we'll go through that today. Uh, I was trying to think of a way, and I talked to Dad yesterday, I really wanted to think of a way that I could bring in a bucket of water and make this pump and float. This is not going to happen, okay? Um, and so I'm sorry for that, but uh, I'll, I'll come up with something better next time I preach on this. Anyway, visible representation, cutting edge. Now, thankfully, Dad sharpened it for us, so don't come up here and grab it. Um, 2 Kings uh, chapter uh, 6, they're thinking through this passage. Why is it important for us to reclaim our cutting edge? Let me explain what I mean by that. There are times in our life, there are seasons in our life, when we really are on the cutting edge of our relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? And by that, I mean that we are really on fire for the Lord. It's that time in our life when we'll make the most difference for Him. It's that season when we are on fire, we're pumped. It's times in our life when we're excited to be a believer. Times in our life when all we can talk about is how great He is. And it's those times that I'm referring to. Those times when we are excited. Those times when, when God can do no wrong. Those times when we feel like we are up on that mountaintop in our relationship with God. Now those times typically happen after a major event. Obviously, after a person gets saved, you hope that they're in one of those times, right? You, you hope after a person gets baptized that they're pumped and they're ready to serve the Lord. Uh, we might feel that way right after God answers a major prayer concern for us, right? We might feel that way whenever we receive an unexpected blessing. We, we might feel that way after just an incredible revival meeting. We might feel that way this, this cutting-edge time of our life right after a great sermon as individuals. Now, churches may also feel those times as well in the life of their church. Uh, they feel that way perhaps after the completion of a major project. They, they get something done. It's accomplished. It's ready. Uh, churches feel that way after there is a miraculous and unexplained healing in the church. I, I think we had a sense of that uh, after Jackson had his surgery, right? And then 48 hours later, after major brain surgery, walks out of the hospital. Right? Our church was excited about that. We felt that cutting edge in our relationship with the Lord. Uh, we may feel uh, that time as a church family, um, again, when we accomplish something major, whenever something great is happening in the church, the, the times that we are bold in the power of Jesus Christ. The, uh, the churches feel that way often after they secure a new pastor, right? And there's this, this honeymoon phase, and, and everything's going great, and, and everything's going wonderful, and we try to as pastors, we try to keep that going just as long as humanly possible, right? Uh, but we feel that sense of encouragement. We feel that joy. We feel that cutting edge aspect in our relationship with the Lord. Those times when we are bold in the power of Jesus Christ. You ever been through those times in your life? Times when we genuinely feel like we are as close to the Lord as we've ever been. Like we have all the power of God, and we can take on anything. It's those cutting-edge times in our faith that I want to talk about this morning. Those cutting-edge times in our faith when we are most able to make a dent in this world for the cause of Christ. Now, we don't always stay up on that high, do we? Right? Because things happen. Life goes on. Something happens and we're let down in some way. The wind is let out of our sails. We can quickly find ourselves in the valley. Things don't go just as they were planned. Something is harder to get accomplished than we initially thought. It takes longer to get something done than we had initially estimated. And we lose our cutting edge. Or, or let's just be honest. Sometimes we've been saved so long that the wonder of Christ has lost its wonder. We've been saved so long that the wonder of Christ have lost this wonder. We, we've been saved so long that being a believer is a way of life rather than a changer of life. It's just what we do. We've been saved so long that our relationship with the Lord is no longer as exciting as it once was. And now we're just going through the motions. We love Jesus, we do, and, and we're on our way to heaven, but we're just sort of floating through our relationship with Him. When that happens, we have to ever be so much more intentional in our relationship with Him and about reclaiming that cutting edge. 
Now, as we get into it this morning, there's a man in Scripture who performed many wonderful miracles. Uh, he cured a man of leprosy. He, uh, he multiplied bread and miraculously fed a bunch of people. And who am I talking about? Elisha. Now, Jesus did as well, but I'm talking about Elisha. Elijah was his mentor. Elisha was the one who was trained by Elijah. He also healed the waters of Jericho. He got really mad at some people one time, and he called down a curse from God, and God had a bunch of bears attack and kill people. That's crazy, isn't it? Uh, he multiplied the poor widow's oil. He removed poison from a pot of stew, and he made an axe head float. And it's funny, I know what you're probably thinking. Of all those really cool miracles, I choose to preach on the most least impressive one. Right? <laughs> big deal, he made an axe head float. It is a big deal. And I want to show you why, because I think there's a lesson, and I think there's a challenge here for us. Look with me in verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 6. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God, that's Elisha, he said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand, and he took it. Father in heaven, as we dig into your word this morning, I pray that you will challenge us in a special way. Lord, if there are those who have lost their cutting edge of their faith, it, it, something's just missing there. They're not where they once were. Lord, would you challenge us in a great way? Would you encourage us and help us to see through this story how we can reclaim that cutting edge in our life? Or more importantly, if there's one here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, might this message speak to, the, speak to them? And might they choose to accept you as their Lord before it's everlasting too late? In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to challenge you this morning about reclaiming the cutting edge of your faith. Now, doing so is going to take a great deal of work. Reclaiming the cutting edge of your faith is going to take a great deal of effort. But as it relates to axes, I'm reminded of what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, if you give me six hours to cut down a tree, I'll spend four hours sharpening my axe. He points to the amount of work and preparation that is necessary to get the work done. And I think about that and I apply it to this message. Living in the splendor of a relationship with Jesus Christ takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. So I want to come at this from the example of an axe head that was loaned, lost, and located. Okay. First, understand this. The axe head was loaned. Notice verse 5 again. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. So the worker is upset because he's borrowed this axe, and now it's broken and lost, and it's his fault. Someone had loaned the man his axe. It's important to us because back then, this was an expensive piece of equipment. And it meant something. When someone loans you something, you take care of it, and what do you do? You give it back to them in better condition than you received it. And so now he understands he's going to have to go to this man, and he's going to have to say, hey, I, I broke and lost your axe head. Something that could have been very expensive at the time. Not only that, but now the man is upset because there's a whole team of men around him who are chopping wood and who are working, and now he can't contribute in that way. And so he cries out to Elisha, his teacher, and he says, alas, right? It was borrowed. When you think of the accent this morning, I want you to think of the power that God has given you in your life. And, and we think about that power. The power comes whenever you accept Christ as your own. And that power is on loan when you call on Him as Lord. He allows you to use His power. He loans that power to you. He gives you access to His power. But it's really His, amen? Amen. He just loans it to you as a believer. Now, what does that power do? Why is it so important for us as believers to think through that power and understand it? 
The power that God gives us when we become believers, it gives us strength in dark days. Right? It allows us to go through really hard, difficult times. He uses that same power through us to draw men unto Himself so that they can become saved. In fact, it's God's power that does the redeeming work and saves the lost. It's the power of God that helps us get through unimaginable circumstances to do unbelievable work to live an incredible life of faith. And again, while we have access to that power, it really is His. And it's His power that gives us this cutting edge in our lives. He loans it to us. Just as the man loaned the axe uh, to this man that belonged to Elisha. I read this past week and it fits here. While we have the privilege of being a tool God uses, again, He loans us His power. While we have the privilege of being a tool God uses to share the gospel, the actual act of redeeming someone through God's power is all God's work. Right? So whenever we witness and whenever we share the gospel with others, and they come to know Him as Lord and Savior, we're just the tool. If I'm being quite honest and transparent, one of the things that aggravates me most about preachers is when we say, I led so-and-so to the Lord. I led so and I prayed the sinner's prayer with so-and-so. I led him to the No, you didn't. You were a tool. God saved that man. God allowed you to be a part of that conversation but he simply loans you the power necessary so that you can help that man come to an understanding of saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's his power. It's on loan to us. Jesus is quoted by Luke in Acts 1.8 of saying this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Or you will be my witnesses in Cedar Fort and in North Carolina and in the United States and in all the world. And how and why does that happen? Because He gives us, He loans us the power to do so. The songwriter was right when he said, All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. In other words, what we need to do, what we need to do the work of God is not us or even in us, but is entirely in Him. And He loans us that power. This cutting edge comes from the power of God in our lives. It's prevalent in our work. We see it in our worship. It's in our way of life. That power is provided to us by God through His Holy Spirit. It's borrowed power. It's only because of Him. It's His power. It's not anything we can do. It's all His. And He gives it to us. Power to love and serve Him and others and represent Him and do His work for the church. Just as the man borrowed the act to do his work, so also does God borrow us to do his work. And he loans us that power. I think through that. I think through the little boy who said to the Sunday school teacher, what must I do to be saved? And the Sunday school teacher said, nothing. Jesus did it all. Jesus did it all. And he loans us that power. Jesus said in John 15, 5, for without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. It's all because of Him. It's all through Him. It's all in Him. And so we think about the axe and the axe handle. The problem the man was facing was that the axe handle had separated and had fallen into the water. The axe is useless without the axe handle. The axe handle is useless without the axe head. It does no one any good. You can't beat a tree down, can you? But we can cut a tree down. You can't beat firewood, but we can cut firewood. If all we're swinging is the axe handle we won't get much done. Let me say it this way as it relates to our relationship with Christ. If we are laboring in the flesh without the help and power of the Holy Spirit, we won't get much done. It would be so tiresome, and it is, if you've ever been a part of it, to just labor in the flesh, to constantly do things our own way, seeing little or no results, just swinging the axe handle of our own human effort that makes no dent whatsoever for the cause of Christ in this world. I'm reminded of the famous King Louis XIV. He was a great king, a good king. But when he died, uh, his people were very upset and sad. And so they had this massive funeral for him. And they're at this funeral, and they turn all the lights, all the candles are snuffed out. There's only one candle, and that one candle is sitting on top of King Louis' casket. And the people are making a spectacle of themselves. They loved him. He was a good king, but they're just going on 
and they're they're crying and they're weeping and they're wailing and you know they're acting uh, halfway crazy. <laughs> Finally, it becomes the preacher's turn to preach. Uh, he's going to do the sermon, and he walks to the pulpit and he reaches over the edge of the pulpit and he snuffs out that candle. His sermon was a lot less, uh, a lot shorter than what my sermon will be today. His sermon was only four words. So he reaches over, he snuffs out the candle, and he says this, God only is great. Hmm. Now we think through that, right? We think through the power that is on loan to us through the Holy Spirit from God. It's His power. He loans it to us. Number two, the axe head was lost. The axe head was lost. Again, notice the first half of verse 5. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Now, we think through that, and we know that if we aren't careful, we can lose, and we do lose our cutting edge. But we can lose God's power if we're not careful. It can be an easy thing to neglect and lose that power, and oftentimes you don't even know what's happened. Because again, you're just going through the motions. You're just doing what you've always done as a believer, and all of a sudden you realize, man, something's missing. Remember when Samson and Delilah were going through their ordeal, when she had finally tricked him, right? He had fallen asleep, and she had finally tricked him, and they come in and they cut all of his hair. Remember what he said when he woke up? He said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But the Bible says he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Here's the deal with the axe head. The axe head was lost while the man was busy. He was working. He was doing what was expected of him, right? He didn't lose it because he was lazy. He didn't lose it because he was being idle. He lost the axe head because he was being careless. He didn't check to make sure it was still uh, securely fastened. He failed to take care of it. He failed to check to see if the axe head was still snug on that handle. He lost it because he was being careless. Here's how this relates. Church family, sometimes we can get so busy working for the Lord that we fail to worship the Lord. Now let's think about that for a minute. We can get so busy working for the Lord that we fail to worship the Lord. And that's a dangerous place to be. Remember Mary and Martha and Luke 10 as Jesus comes in. He's in their home, right? What does Mary do? She stops and she sits at his feet and she literally hangs on every word he's speaking. He's there speaking and teaching and preaching and she's there and she's listening and she's worshiping the Lord her God. But then Martha, she's there and she's working and she's serving and she's taking care of people. And in fact, she gets upset when Jesus won't rebuke Mary. Martha was convinced that she had it right because she was working for the Lord, but she had failed to worship the Lord. Worshiping Him is so much more important than working for Him. Just because we're busy doesn't mean we're being a blessing. Just because we're busy doesn't mean we're being a blessing. We need to be careful that our worship always takes priority over our work. And here's what I can tell you. This is a working church. The church does a ton even as we come out of COVID and begin to look forward, there's this happening, that happening, we're doing this, we're doing that, which is great. Great to have those kind of ministries. But we have to be careful not to let our work overtake our worship. That's what's most important. And let me talk about what it means to worship the Lord just for a minute. Just for a minute. Let me explain what worship is by explaining what worship is not. Okay? Worship is not... And I, I read part of this this past week. Worship is not the sort of casual chatter that happens and we occasionally drown out the organ prelude, right? That's not necessarily worship. Worship is when we sing and we celebrate God's goodness together and we allow the organ and the piano and the music to help us glorify God. That's when we worship. Worship is not the, the mumbling of prayers or the, the silent whispers of hymns with little to no thought or heart. Worship is when we are celebrating our God together earnestly in prayer and intensely in song. Worshiping Him. A lot of folks are, are mad and upset about the election results. Listen, God is enough. Amen. God is enough. Amen. And it's like I told some of you, a hundred years from now, it won't make a difference to any of us. Because if we're saved and loving Jesus and believers in Him, we will be gathered around His throne and we won't think twice about Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Amen. 
God is enough. So the man loses his axe head. It sinks into the dark and muddy waters of the Jordan River. It is not retrievable by human standards. But look at number three. The axe head was located. All right? So first it was loaned, then it was lost, and now it's located. And I, I bring that up in this sermon because with God's help, if you've lost your cutting edge, if you've lost that power, if you've lost that sense of relationship with Jesus, it can be regained. You can get that back. You can get back the power in your life. It's possible to recover that cutting edge. In, the, in that verse, Elijah asked the man, he said, where did it fall? And the man showed him the place. It's important to, for us to remember that if we've lost our cutting edge, when we realize that the power of God is not in us like it once was, we not only admit that we have lost it, but we go back to the place where it was lost. We think about that, that the place of departure can also be the place of recovery. What were you doing when you had that, that real sense of power, when you had that real sense of relationship with Jesus Christ? Go back to that place. He's not changed. He's not moved. He's still there. I'm reminded of Jesus in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. He's speaking to the church at Ephesus who has lost their first love. They're guilty of working. They worked themselves to death, but they weren't worshiping Him. And He said there in verse 5, He said, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He calls them back to order. I wonder if He's calling Cedar Fork back to order. I wonder if we've lost our first love. I wonder if we need to repent and return to our first works lest He comes to us quickly and removes our lampstand from its place. It can be reclaimed. That cutting edge that the church that you as a believer had or have, it can be reclaimed. One author said this, Have you lost your power in the waters of worldliness? Have you lost your power in the waters of indifference? Have you lost your power in Christ in the waters of neglect? Have you lost the power that you once had in Christ in the waters of church trouble? If so, it can be reclaimed. It can be regained. The axe head was miraculously restored. Look at verse 6 and 7. The man of God, Elisha, said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. And he cut off a stick and he threw it in there and he made the iron float. And he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and he took it. Certainly a great miracle, amen? amen? A heavy piece of iron is now floating. The man reaches in and gets it. It's recovered. Now it took an act of God to recover it, didn't it? It took a miracle. Recovering our cutting edge, reclaiming the cutting edge of Christ in our lives. Listen, it happens it happens through prayer. It happens through dedication. It's something that we've been emphasizing a lot lately here at church since I've started. Is, is, is this prayer life, this active prayer life. I read a couple of weeks ago, no Christian is better than his prayer life. I think through that, I, I think through reclaiming this edge. I think through churches and, and me as a, as a believer and the fact that I need to reclaim some of the power that I once had in Christ. I think through what that power does especially and why it's so important. I want to close with an illustration that you may have heard before. Um, it's about a man named Derek Redmond. Derek Redmond was a track star. He ran the 4x4 four, uh, four relay for the British sprint team. And he was participating in the Olympics years ago. He was the last guy to get the baton and he was counted on uh, to, bring, to bring the gold home. He was one of the fastest guys on the team. So the story goes, and if you've ever seen the video, you know it's true. They come to hand the baton off to Derek, and, and he grabs it. His job is to bring it home. He grabs it, and he, and he begins racing around that track, and he's leading. They're going to win. They're going to win that gold medal. But as he gets to either the second or third turn there on the track, he ruptures uh, his Achilles tendon. And immediately he falls flat down right on his face. And you can sort of see him writhing there in pain and, and grabbing at that tendon. It's said that it was so quiet in the stadium he could have heard a pin drop. He begins crawling to the finish line. All of a sudden, up in the crowd, uh, there's movement. A man rises to his feet. He races uh, through the crowd, 
hops over the barrier and jumps onto the track and goes and grabs Derek and lifts him up and begins to carry him to the finish line. About that time, a judge approaches and says, Sir, you, you can't do that. I'm sorry. You can't be down here right now. And the man that came to help Derek said, Yes, I can. This is my boy. And his dad had come to help him. Church family, there is a God who sits in the stands up on high. Who is ready and who is willing and who has already come down from those stands to help us to the finish line. To carry us to that finish line. Who desperately wants us to be close to Him. Who wants us to have that power to accomplish great and wonderful things in His name. Who wants to, to be there in our time of need and to support us like ever before. To support us as individual church members and to support us as a church. Certainly we understand that His power was loaned to us and there may be times in our life and in the life of a church when that power was lost. But it can certainly be located and it can be reclaimed. And the way that happens is as individuals we repent of our sin. We return to our first love. We, we understand how much more important worship is over work. And we continue to worship Him. And if we're not worshiping Him, we return to worshiping and loving our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All that from an accent. Amen? Amen. Amen? Father in heaven, you're good to us. You're so good. You've given us this story of uh, a man who was simply working working for you, as a matter of fact. Building this dormitory that, uh, that Elisha and, and some of uh, his pupils would stay in. And we have this wonderful example that you gave us, Lord, and, and this axe head flies off and it sinks and Elisha's there. And, and the axe head, we know, is, it, it symbolizes your power, your power that, that we get only through, through you, Lord, from your Holy Spirit. Father, perhaps as a church family, we've lost our cutting edge. Perhaps as an individual, we've lost our cutting edge. But Lord, it can be located if we would repent and return to you. I pray, God, that you will challenge our hearts. Help us, God, to, to understand if our relationship with you is not what it once was. Lord, may, may we make the decision this morning, today, today, Lord, that we would return to you our first love. We thank you, God, so much for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that your word teaches that if we would return to you, you would welcome us home with open arms. That if we would confess our sin, you are just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, speak to our people this morning, please. Help them identify and understand what their relationship with you looks like. And I pray, God, your Holy Spirit would have His way and move upon us today. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen and amen.